Good evening, everyone, and thanks for coming tonight to the Gallery of Modern Art for our Perspectives Asia lecture, Fair Go Mate, the changing language and practice of Australian values diplomacy in times of uncertainty and risk. As many of you know, I'm Zara Stanhope from the Asian and Pacific Curatorial Department here at the Gallery. And before we get going, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we're gathering, pay respect to the Turbal and Jugara people, and their elders past, present and future, and also extend respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. In the spirit of reconciliation here at the gallery, we always recognise the role that Indigenous elders past, present and future and emerging have played and continue to play within our shared creative community. So welcome, and I would very much like to start by acknowledging our speaker tonight, Professor Emeritus John Fitzgerald from Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne. Also to acknowledge Jin Long Xu, Consul, Consulate General of the People's Republic of China in Brisbane, and of course, Professor Caitlin Byrne, the Director of the Griffiths Asia Institute at Griffiths University. And just to note an apology from our Director, Chris Sains tonight, and Deputy Director, uh, Simon Elliott. So welcome to our fourth seminar this year, in 2019, and actually the beginning of 15 years of Perspective Asia talks. This series, as most of you know, is a number of public programs that are designed by the Griffiths Asia Institute at Griffiths University and this Australian Centre for Asia Pacific Art here at the gallery. And their purpose is to explore issues of contemporary culture, politics and society in our region, while fostering public discussion of Australia's relations with its regional neighbours. And we've seen many topics discussed in that forum. We felt privileged to host a diverse range of speakers on various issues, and tonight we're continuing this legacy. And just before I introduce um, our speaker, I just wanted to note for you our next lecture that's coming up on the 29th of August, which will be presented by Professor Mina Roches from the University of New South Wales on women's movements in the Philippines. And also to note our sponsor, Yering Station. So tonight, it's a great honour to welcome Professor John Fitzgerald from the Centre for Social Impact at Swinburne University, who's addressing a topic that I think we've all got some investment in. His broad ranging expertise and interdisciplinary research includes Chinese Australian community studies, Asia Pacific philanthropy and the non-profit sector, history and politics of China, East Asian nationalism and Asian languages. Professor Fitzgerald's roles have included directing the International Centre of Excellence in Asia Pacific Studies at the Australian National University, and while in Canberra, also serving as chair of the Education Committee of the Australia China Council of the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and being chair of the Committee for National and International Cooperation of the Australian Research Council, and International Secretary of the Australian Academy of Humanities. So you can see he's ultimately extremely well qualified to talk to us this evening on this topic. John was also head of the School of Social Sciences at La Trobe University and led the Ford Foundation's China operations for five years in Beijing, as well as holding many other positions and of course being an energetic writer and commentator. You might know that his books include Big White Lie, Chinese Australians in White Australia, published through the University of New South Wales, and shortlisted for the Prime Minister's History Prize, and was awarded the Ernest Scott Prize by the Australian Historical Association. And also the book Awakening China, awarded the Joseph Levinson Prize of the American Association for Australian Studies. And his publishing is recognised internationally, of course. So tonight, I'd like you to welcome um, Professor Fitzgerald, who's going to talk for about 20 minutes or so, and then um, have a Q&A with Caitlin Byrne uh, for the remainder of our evening together. So thank you very much, John. Thank you, Zara. With your indulgence, I'd like to speak for 30, if I may. <coughs> so I'll set a little timer going here. There's no clock in the room, is there? No. Well, may I begin by also acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting and paying our respects to their elders past and present. <coughs> 
It's certainly an honour to be here myself to meet with you all. <clears throat> and I wish to thank Griffith Asia Institute Director Professor Caitlin Byrne and her institute team and the Asian and Pacific Arts Centre in Goma, in particular Zara for her presentation and she took me through the extraordinary exhibition that's on here at the present time, which I, well, it doesn't need me to commend it to you. I'm sure you'll be back to take a look. <coughs> um, sorry? Right. <laughs> and to thank them for their generous hospitality in hosting this event. <coughs> so, values in foreign policy, I hear you asking. Are you serious? <coughs> what next? Honesty in real estate? <coughs> so let me begin with a story or two, suitably embellished with martial metaphors in the Australian tradition, to show why we do need to care about values in foreign policy. A year ago this day, the 4th of July 2018, the flagship of Australian values diplomacy, mateship, went down with all hands <clears throat> on the Potomac River in Washington, D.C. That day last year had been set aside for the launch in Washington of an exercise in Australian values diplomacy to commemorate a centenary of Allied combat involving Australian and American forces in foreign fields. Sadly, the launch turned into a scuttling. <clears throat> Around six months before that planned centenary celebration, Australia's ambassador to the United States, Joe Hockey, initiated a cultural diplomacy campaign in Washington under the title, Celebrating a Centenary of Mateship. And a banner bearing these words was draped across the Australian Embassy on Massachusetts Avenue, and the Embassy launched a dedicated web page explaining what it was all about, oh, excuse me, explaining what it was all about, packed with historical information and explanations, and announcing a calendar of events, including a military tattoo, a religious service in Washington. <coughs> and a televised centenary commemoration involving Prime Minister Turnbull and President Donald Trump. The occasion being marked was certainly deserving of commemoration. 100 years earlier, on the 4th of July 1918, Australian and American troops under the command of Sir General John Monash conducted a successful offensive against German forces in the French town of Hamel, which may be familiar to you helping to turn the tide at that stage against German forces in France. This was the first time American and Australian troops had fought side by side under a non and, and the first occasion on which American troops fought under a non-American commander. At that time, General Monash chose July 4 as the date on which to launch this attack in order to signify the significance, the cultural significance of the event. <clears throat> but no sooner was the schedule of centenary events launched and underway than journalist Meg Palmer detonated a digital limpet. <coughs> On the 3rd of July, she pointed out in her online newsletter that all 15 centenary of mateship ambassadors were male and white. They included prime ministers and presidents, but not Barack Obama and not Julia Gillard. <clears throat> all hands on deck. Now this may not have concerned Ambassador Hockey, who'd long been engaged alongside Prime Minister Abbott in a series of domestic culture wars, celebrating national values such as mateship, while dissing concerns about gender equity and cultural diversity as self-indulgent identity politics. And yet their Australian brand of values diplomacy and identity politics focusing on white male mateship did not sail well in American waters, not even in President Trump's America First America. The Australians had misread their mates. An apology was issued. Uh, Joe Hockey uh, accepted the blame. The banner was hauled down. Nothing more was heard of the centenary of mateship. <clears throat> From that moment forward, 
radio silence was maintained over the year-long calendar of events. We know nothing more about them. <clears throat> of course, it was also broadcast throughout the United States, not just here in Australia. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, to be fair, men on both sides of Australian politics are prone to nostalgia around old-fashioned values and tempted to translate their homespun folklore into international public diplomacy. Labor may be less inclined than the coalition parties to trumpet national values in its foreign policy statements, and yet Labor has a similar weakness for translating working men's values into bilateral public diplomacy. This case in relation to China. For example, speaking, on, speaking in Beijing on the 40th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Australia and China in July 2012, Deputy Prime Minister Wayne Swan, from the Labor side, you'll recall, evoked a powerful image of mateship among working men to stamp Labor's brand, brand on the Australia-China relationship. He drew a graphic mental picture of his mentor, Mick Young, accompanying then opposition leader Gough Whitlam on that breakthrough tour of China in 1971. Now, there's a lot to remember about that visit. Uh, there are books that have been written about it, but Swan chose to recall just one episode in particular at this commemorative event. And let me quote, Mick was a sheep shearer, a good one too, before he became a union official and then a political leader. <clears throat> he had the big hands of a professional shearer. It would have given him great pleasure to firmly shake the hand of Zhou Enlai the, when the Premier greeted the Australian delegation. Now, there's no doubting that it's a privilege for anyone to shake the hand of Premier Zhou Enlai. And yet this nostalgic evocation of mateship among the workers of the world, an Australian shearer shaking hands with a leader of proletarian China, is not really reciprocated in China. Everyone knows that Premier Zhou hailed from one of the elite imperial families that successfully migrated to the peak of the Communist Party hierarchy following the end of empire. He could trace the pedigree of successful imperial examination candidates and imperial magistrates on his maternal and his maternal, paternal and maternal lines. It's a privilege to shake the hands of Zhou Enlai because Zhou Enlai's was the hand of privilege. And Zhou Enlai shook a lot of hands. Enough of stories, my point here in reverting to metaphors of scuttled fleets and shorn fleeces, is to highlight a shift that is taking place in Australian public life around values which has bearing on public diplomacy. Even before the good ship mateship went down in DC, a new suite of values had been commissioned by the Turnbull government in its 2017 foreign policy white paper, which made no mention of mateship or the fair go at all. The 2017 white paper <coughs> repositioned Australian values diplomacy from old and the old and familiar territory of white Australian male folklore and relocated in the global commons of liberal values or universal values. Mateship and the fair go made way for freedom, democracy and rule of law. And I think this hasn't been given the attention it deserves, this shift in the language of public diplomacy of the Australian government and its implications. <clears throat> so how did it come to this? And where do we go from here? The place of values in foreign and defence policy has been shown, generally speaking, into sharp relief globally by the destructive, disruptive times in which we live. Shifting power relations in the region challenges to the post-war international order and the rise of populist nationalism around the globe all present ethical challenges, ethical as well as policy challenges. At the popular level, movements targeting religious and ethnic difference test the commitment of all immigrant countries, not just Australia, to inclusion, equality and diversity. <clears throat> Among state actors, a dynamic and increasingly powerful China is driving structural and strategic changes in the region and showing little sympathy for the values underpinning rule of law or the liberal rules-based order, which has prevailed since World War II. 
and the Trump administration's response to that China challenge brings the long-term viability of that order into question. So the question arises for Australia whether the values by which Australians actually live their lives, rather than the folkloric traditions to which we've been inducted, can actually help governments to negotiate safe passage through these complex ethical and policy issues. And that's, in a sense, where I'm coming from in this talk. <clears throat> because recent Australian governments and oppositions appear to think that values do have a place, and it's quite different from that which has prevailed in Australia for the last three decades. A crude but useful measure of government foreign policy thinking <clears throat> um, can be gleaned from a series of formal statements on values and foreign policy issued in Canberra in the past two decades. I'm thinking here specifically of the three foreign policy white papers issued in 1997 and 2003 by the Howard government and then in 2017 by the Turnbull government. Note, all were issued by coalition governments and all were issued by one department, DFAT, Foreign Affairs and Trade. So, Given these similarities, the differences between the earliest and laters is really quite revealing. <clears throat> it's not just different groups coming up with different views. It's a transition within a political system, I would suggest, around values. The first two white papers issued under Prime Minister Howard made a number of unequivocal statements about Australian values, but reflected that government's preference for describing them in colloquial or folkloric terms such as mateship and the fair go. Values so described were then subordinated to the pursuit of jobs and security in, <clears throat> as the basic test of national interest guiding foreign policy. And this is explicitly set out, particularly in the first of the foreign policy white papers, but replicated in the second. <clears throat> so in effect, in practice, the effect was to exclude values diplomacy from the foreign policy toolbox. You know, mateship doesn't really travel or translate well, as we found in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> and given that it doesn't travel well, um, it raises particular questions at the present time in Australia's relations with the region. The subordination of values, excuse me, <clears throat> the subordination of values to interests was facilitated by Prime Minister Howard's ethno-cultural approach to national identity and values. The first of the white papers explicitly projected an ethnically grounded national identity rooted in a distinctively European, if not British, social and cultural heritage. And I quote, the values which Australia brings to its foreign policy reflect a predominantly European intellectual and cultural heritage. That's where we're coming from, that's where we're staying. No, that's my, sorry, addition that was not in the white paper. The second identified Australia as a cultural outlier with, and I quote, a predominantly European heritage in an otherwise alien region. Translated into diplomacy, this approach implied Australia had one set of values, Asian countries, presumably another, <coughs> and that all parties should respect their values by saying nothing about them whatsoever. That is, leave values at the door when you move into negotiation, which was, has been, I think, for some decades, Australia's standard approach to relations with countries in the region. Now, China was quite comfortable with this arrangement. It confirmed the view in Beijing that Australia was still at heart white Australia and that this effectively isolated Australia from other countries in the region. It precluded values advocacy, and Australia was not proposing to put mateship into a UN convention. It implied that all values were based on national cultures and traditions rather than principles that all humans or people might aspire to, hence endorsing the authoritarian values of the communist government as an authentic expression of China's national culture, for Beijing what was not to like about that package of assumptions. And yet in Australia, these national foreign policy statements were not really sustainable, as they never truly enjoyed bipartisan support in fact, they reflected highly partisan politic, political positions on identity and values. National values, as they were known at the time, featured, you'll recall, in a wide-ranging public debate in the 1990s on the so-called Asianisation of Australia, associated with Paul, Ke Paul Keating's term as Prime Minister. <clears throat> 
This debate merged into a wider series of discursive battles that came to be known as the culture wars and the history wars. And it's here that the folkloric values were cultivated, grown, and subsequently transplanted into foreign policy documents. These domestic debates over national values and identity then played out in the two strategic, the two first strategic statements by the Howard government on values, the, two, the first two foreign policy white papers. <clears throat> in particular, the second white paper's choice of tolerance, perseverance and mateship as distinctively Australian values guiding our foreign policy can be traced to a domestic policy debate taking place around education, culture and immigration, not around foreign policy. In an Australia Day address in 1998, two years into his first term, Prime Minister Howard made a pointed reference to the values that are particularly important to us all, and he listed tolerance, perseverance and mateship explicitly among them. Then marking the centenary of Federation in 2001, the four distinctive values he identified were self-reliance, a fair go, pulling together and having a go. One way or another, almost all of these then found their way into foreign policy white papers. In the first white paper, fair go got a good run, and in the second one, the values of mateship, tolerance and perseverance each earned a spot. <clears throat> At that time then, the coalition government consistently framed values in foreign policy documents in a language that alienated the opposition, the Labor side of politics, which perhaps explains why Labor was so very silent on the subject of values in its own major policy statement of the period, the Australia in the Asia Century White Paper, which was published in 2012. And the reason, I suspect, for Labor's silence on values in that document is actually set out in the document itself. Let me quote, <coughs> uh, referring to values, it said, Australian values, as they've been described to date, are oriented mainly towards the British Empire and Europe <coughs> and reflect the attitudes and values at a time when many Australians defined themselves as distant and separate from Asia. So the point of the white paper was to reflect on this distancing effect of the colloquialisation or folkloric character of Australian values and foreign policy without actually making any commitment to values at all. It's as if it wanted to take values off the table. So the authors opted, in a sense, to respond to this nationalisation of values, not by updating values or putting a Labor stamp on any, but by treading lightly around values as if it risked, didn't want to risk stirring the beast in the basement of Australian domestic politics. Well, in time, this lack, I'd suggest, of bipartisan support for key values statements in major foreign policy statements presented problems for Australia managing its relations in the region, particularly its relationship with China. And this is what's triggered in 2017 the new values statement of the 2017 White Paper. And it's very clear about that. I refer you to it. I don't have time here to go into detail. The 2017 White Paper sidestepped the earlier ethno-cultural approach and described values in terms of universal liberal principles. I quote, Australia does not define its national identity by race or religion, it says. By the way, it makes no reference to Europe or Britain or any other country as the source of these values. And it elevated values in foreign policy by shifting the locus of national identity from one based on a sort of defined ethno-cultural heritage to one grounded in universal values. Quite remarkably, it says, Australia does not define its national identity by race or religion, but by shared values. And this is what they are. Political, economic and religious freedom, liberal democracy, rule of law, racial and gender equality, and mutual respect. This, mind you, uh, in the very year in which the government's ambassador in DC was planning a very different celebration. But how well that white paper anticipated the difficulties of the earlier uh, values agenda, which, it, which sunk mateship on the Potomac. Then what of Labor? In government, in fact, Labor has never produced a foreign policy white paper. It's not likely to do so for a while yet either. Although it did publish two defence 
white papers, one in 2009, the other in 2013. Prime Minister Rudd's 2009 defence white paper was the first formal statement by an Australian government to take an account of the impact of China's growing wealth and power on Australia's shifting strategic environment, for which it earned a very stern rebuke in Beijing. I'm not sure if you'll recall, but that defence white paper uh, went silent very soon because of um, the resistance from Beijing to its implications. Labor then produced an all-encompassing statement on Australia's place in the region, Australia in the Century, Asia Century white paper. <coughs> But this made little effort, this white paper, to reconcile the security concerns of the defence side of the Labor government <clears throat> with the diplomatic and trade issues of DFAT on the other within the framework of a single strategy document. And mm. it strikes me that this actually is the burden of the 2017 white paper. It's to crunch together the defence and security, the trade and diplomacy sides of Australia's engagement with China and the region. And then, consistent with the Turnbull White Paper, Labor's foreign affairs spokesperson, Senator Penny Wong, gave a hard-hitting talk on the place of values in Labor foreign policy here at the Griffith Asia Institute in a major talk in August 2017. Some of you may have attended. I wish I had. It's quite a remarkable document. I can't quote from it at length, but it's quite moving <coughs> as well as compelling in the statements that it makes as she is a Chinese-Australian citizen. But in relation to values, she says this, there are of course those who dismiss values as a trap that only encourage cont encourages contention and conflict. She was presumably addressing those on her own side of politics who were intimidated by the terms of deba debate on national values launched by the Howard government in the wake of Keating's defeat. And Labor was very wary of being ensnared in the populist debates around mateship and the fair, fair go. <clears throat> which she says, time to cast all that aside. She doesn't quite say that. Which is emboldened to break the Labor mould, clearly, if you read this speech, for reasons similar to those that compelled Turnbull. These include, and I quote, threats to the rules-based order, signs of growing racial and national intolerance, and evidence that countries, including China, were acting to undermine the post-war security regime. She began with a personal anecdote and ended with a clear affirmation of the place of values in Australian foreign policy, dismissing both the Asian values and the Western values schools of thought along the way, and making a very clear statement on behalf of Australia <clears throat> to embracing universal values. She highlighted the rule of law as a foundation both for democratic societies and for an international rules-based order, and hence for Australia's foreign policy establishment. She concluded her observation on the discussion of rule of law, which is introduced as a value, with the observation that values as a core element in the construction of a foreign policy are not just desirable, but necessary. This is very new for a Labor government, or for a Labor in opposition, for a Labor spokesperson. It clearly came from a conversation within Labor, roughly comparable to that which is taking place in the coalition. So where do we go from here? Despite an emerging bipartisan consensus, the question of whether the recent affirmation of universal values will translate into effective foreign policy or foreign policy practice remains an open one. <clears throat> I'd suggest we all keep an eye on this space in coming years. Foreign policy experts are already divided, <clears throat> divided both about what it means in practice to have a values diplomacy and divided over what values diplomacy itself means. Let me give you an example. Um, some suggest that the shift from particular national values to common or universal ones signals closer alignment with the United States and a greater distancing from China. So Deakin Professor Pan Cheng Xin regards the emphasis on universal values in the 2017 White Paper as a terrible mistake, a misguided attempt to differentiate Australia from China and so align it more closely with the US. And yet other analysts see the reverse, um, as the US alliance is based not just on values, but on real politique. And Alan Dupont pointed out, Alan Dupont of the Cognoscenti Group, that a values-based foreign policy could actually see the end of bipartisanship on the US alliance, 
<clears throat> because if we start holding Trump to account to some of these values, who knows where we'll end up. He didn't quite say that, but that's the implication. Let me explain why. Because Sen he made those remarks after Senator Wong initially responded to Donald Trump's election in November 2016 with a statement about values which suggested Trump's victory now placed the American Alliance on Labor's watch list. You might want to look out for that speech. I don't have time to repeat it here. Alan DuPont then described her comments at the time as virtue signaling disguised as foreign policy. So values diplomacy presents a risk to the US alliance on the one side, but on the other, the critics suggest it's just a, you know, a form of wording designed to indicate closer alliance with the United States. In my judgment, to suggest the assertion of universal values or a values-based identity in the 2017 white paper inevitably pits values against realpolitik is misleading. The 2017 white paper and Labor's support for its basic principles, quite independently of the white paper, together mark a shift not from a realist to a values-based diplomacy, but from one cluster of values to another in Australia's generally pragmatic foreign policy culture. A shift from a partisan folkloric suite of values unique to Australia to a code of universal values that enjoys bipartisan support and is understood beyond Australia. This shift, I suggest, is long overdue, as was indicated by the fate of mateship in DC a year ago today, but it's especially timely in a period of heightened uncertainty and risk in relation to China and China-US relations. Further, the earlier approach to national values, I'd suggest, left Australia disarmed in dealing with foreign interference on Australian soil, primarily from People's China. Well, might we say to Beijing, fair go, mate. But mateship doesn't translate readily across cultures. And it was never intended to. It was meant to signal Australia as different. <clears throat> as a national value, peculiar to Australia, mateship offers little guidance for dealing with foreign interference from any country as it touches on matters of high principle, underpinning the integrity of our institutions and the sovereignty of our parliaments. And finally, I'd suggest, we misled our friends in China by signalling in earlier foreign policy statements that Australians care less for human dignity, freedom and rule of law than we do for jobs and growth. Leaving values at the door was always a values statement in itself. It signalled incorrectly that Australians don't value values. This was certainly how it was read in China by Australian experts in the Chinese Academy one of whom uh, reported to me that he was signalling to authorities in Beijing that Australia, unlike the US, was highly pragmatic and placed no store in values or principles. That's, what he, that's how he read those white papers, implying anything for a quid, mate. <clears throat> in fact, historically, Australian foreign policy has tended toward the pragmatic, going uh, uh, toward the pragmatic, but it doesn't imply that Australians are willing to sacrifice values and principles. We could go back in history to find examples of principled foreign policy, but one that's relatively recent, at least in my adult lifetime, is that of Gareth Evans' take on liberal internationalism, in his case term constructive internationalism, which was motivated, motivated by high principle, based on values, <clears throat> was dynamic and innovative, and yet never applied beyond concrete instances where it might make a difference, and it did make a difference in those instances. It wasn't a matter of chasing windmills. It was a foreign policy, highly pragmatic and principled. For Australia-China relations, we have comparable models of principled and pragmatic foreign policy already under development. I commend to you Macquarie University Professor Bill Gates' model, just one among many out there in the values marketplace at the moment, which he terms bounded engagement, which affirms, a liberal, humanist, affirms liberal humanist values while preserving much that's mutually beneficial in the Australia-China relationship, which insists that there needs to be further cooperation, more intense cooperation with China on a range of fronts, even while Australians are more alert to the values that might be placed at risk in that relationship. The question where to from here then remains an open one. Whatever the answers may be, I'd suggest that placing the fundamental values that Australians share 
and value onto the national foreign policy agenda and in a language that all sides within the country can embrace and outside the country can understand <clears throat> brings greater clarity to the differences separating Australia and particularly from China that are patently in need of protection in President Xi Jinping's new era. If values matter, then getting them right is an essential foundation for a pragmatic and principled foreign policy. Thank you. <clears throat>